Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the World Optometry webinar. My name is Lorcan, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm joined by my colleague, Rola, and Rola will be helping me facilitate with any questions or any problems that we have. Before we get started, I would just like to address some general housekeeping rules. If it be possible, if you could please turn your camera off and turn your microphones off. Sometimes having background noise can be slightly difficult for the guest speaker and also other attendees. If you do have any difficulty or if you don't know how to do this, please ask my colleague Rola in the chat function and she'll be able to tell you how to do that. We'd also like you to be able to rename your electronic device to the name that you register for this webinar. And this is to obtain your certificate of registration, your certificate of attendance. So please rename your device. And again, if you don't know how to do this, please contact Rola through the chat function and she'll be able to explain to you how to do this properly. It's very important to be able to receive your certificate of attendance for the webinar to be able to attend the full duration of the presentation. There's also going to be some questions sent to you in a email, a survey feedback email at the end of the presentation. We'd also like you to be able to engage with some of the presentation questions. Our guest speaker was going to be engaging with you too as well. And it'd be very important to be able to engage with him with some of the questions he asks. Today's presentation will last approximately 35 to 45 minutes followed by a 10 to 15 minutes Q&A session. And again, if you do have any questions with regard to how you can obtain your certificate of registration, especially if you maybe have missed this first part if you just arrived, again, please don't hesitate to contact my colleague, Rola. So today's presentation, I'm delighted to present our guest speaker. And the guest speaker today is Dr. Harbour Sian. And Dr. Harbour Sian is an optometrist from uh, British Columbia, Vancouver in Canada and owner of Independent Practice. It's also the creator of a podcast called 2020. So if you do have an opportunity to follow him on Instagram or Facebook, I'd recommend it. The presentation is five steps to starting your dry eye practice. So without any further ado, I'm gonna pass you over to Dr. Harbour Sian. All right, thank you guys. Thank you so much for, for having me. Uh, Lorcan, Sheva, everybody else on the, the World of Optometry team. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I, um, I, I know, I, I see, I could tell that we're all coming from different parts of the world. And um, I appreciate some of you or everybody who's on here, especially the ones who are staying up quite late. Um, you know, I appreciate you taking the time to join for this, uh, po uh, this I don't say podcast, I'm so used to recording my podcast for this um, presentation. Hopefully you find it valuable. Um, Let's see if I can share my screen here to get things going. Actually, while I'm doing this, I'd love to hear uh, just a quick everybody drop uh, in the chat box. Let me know where you're where you're coming in from, um, name of your city or the country at least. I'd love to see uh, who we have and and where everyone's from. All right. Okay. Um, all right. I just want to look at the chat here before I move on. Let's see. India, good. Brazil, great. India, UK, Nigeria, very good. Awesome. Nepal. Awesome, really cool, really cool to see uh, attendees from, from all sorts of different places. Um, good, so I'm gonna assume everyone can see this Lorcan, otherwise I'll let you step in. Our Trinidad and Tobago, Pakistan, Lebanon. Wow, really cool, really cool. I'm very excited that um, we have people coming in from all these different places. I, again, I really hope that this is something you find valuable. Um, and as Lorcan had said, this is called the five-step plan to implementing a new dry eye practice uh, in your office, um, or you could call it starting your, dry, your own dry eye practice, your own dry eye clinic. But I think it's really important to understand that this is coming from, um, this is really for the beginner, somebody who's earlier on in the journey, um, because I'm personally only a couple of years in myself, and it's initially seems very overwhelming um, but once you start to get certain things in place, it starts to ramp up real quick um, and you get comfortable super quick with it too. And I know that in different parts of the world, there'll be different scopes of practice, modes of practice. 
Um, so some of the things I'm saying may not completely apply, but I think if we, we step back and we look at the overall picture, I think you'll be able to uh, take away a lot of this and, and implement it wherever you are in the world. Um, so before we get started, let me tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, my name is Harbir Sayan. I'm just going to put my pointer on here. Laser pointer. There we go. Um, I graduated from the New England College of Optometry in 2010. That's in Boston in the United States. Uh, great city. If you haven't had a chance to visit, highly recommend it. If you're a sports fan of any type, I recommend going in the fall. Uh, lots of amazing sports, basketball, hockey, baseball, football, uh, football meaning American football, you know, throwing the ball. Uh, I'm co-owner of two optometric practices. Um, High Street Eye Care, which is a sublease practice, uh, which is next door to a lens crafter. So uh, I, I guess in the UK, that might be the same as maybe being next door to or within a, a spec savers. Um, and the sep, sep, uh, second office is Clarity Eye Care, which is actually an independent practice, independent optometry clinic, where we run the entire, the entire show where we sell glasses and we do all the dry eye treatments and everything else ourselves. Um, so it's nice to have that double, um, Double, double modality, two different approaches. So we kind of understand it from a, a couple of different ways. Uh, I'm also uh, involved in a few different volunteer type organizations. Um, the first one, it's actually a little bit further down on the list is uh, OneSight, which is an organization, a global organization that goes to different countries to provide eye care services um, for communities that may be um, you know, at need where they don't have access to services. Um, I've been to South America and been to the Middle East um, and, you know, spent a week or so in each, each place to, to help uh, provide eye care services to, to people there who don't have access. Uh, I do a similar thing locally here in Vancouver. That's the Eyeglasses Project on the board of that organization, where, again, we hold clinics and provide eye care services to homeless and other types of populations around here. And more um, of a newer thing, which is um, going to be a bigger endeavor for me now, is I'm the executive director of the Lensbox Foundation, which is essentially combining those kinds of uh, the one site and the eyeglasses project into one organization here um, in Vancouver, but it's going to be reaching hopefully across Canada. Um, we have three different initiatives with the, the Lensbox Foundation. One is the outreach eye care services, you know, doing the eye exams for people who need it but also uh, creating initiatives to reduce the environmental impact of our industry. So uh, supporting recycling programs and things like that for ODs, optometrists to help reduce waste. And the final one is um, something that's really has become very important over the years and becoming kind of coming more to the forefront is uh, providing mental health resources to our colleagues, to, to optometrists and their staff, um, especially coming through the pandemic here. You know, a lot of people are struggling um, with their businesses that have had, you know, challenges and, and, and personally people have had challenges. So we're, we're actually creating a partnership with, um, 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 oh my goodness, what's the right word here? Um, a mental health resource or clinical uh, facility where we're creating a program that's specifically for optometrists. So if, if optometrists would like to uh, speak to somebody, uh, you know, a clinical counselor or someone, we connect them with someone at this organization. So uh, something that we're really excited about that's just coming off the getting off the ground right now. And finally, um, as Lorcan mentioned, I'm on social media quite a bit. Um, you know, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, you can find me pretty much in all of those. Um, but the 2020 podcast is my podcast that's uh, I spend a fair amount of time on these days. I like to interview successful people from different industries, whether it's optometry or uh, business or sports, um, you know, different people who come on and tell us a little bit about their journey. And then we try to learn a bit from them so we can try to implement some of their, their, uh, you know, lessons into our own lives and, and to do better. So, oh yeah, that's me. All right. So uh, disclosures there. All right. So I love this image. This actually came from PowerPoint. I think it's the perfect image for what my journey has felt like into dry eye. It's like a ladder and, you know, uh, and I think we really need, we could really apply the ladder sort of vision or, or analogy to a lot of things in personal or professional, in our personal or professional lives, right? We often wanna jump right to the top of the ladder, but you can't, you gotta start on the first step, that first rung. And when I wanted to get into dry eye, uh, it was almost exactly two years ago. Um, it was actually just less than two years ago, but Alcon had approached me and asked me if I wanted to buy their new 
dry eye treatment device called the ILUX. And we'll talk a little bit about the ILUX in a few minutes, but, um, and I, I love the opportunity. I'd always thought about dry eye in the back of my mind. I, I, I'll tell you a little bit about where I was exactly at that moment. I wasn't doing a very good job as far as treating my patients who had dry eye. Excuse me. I was recognizing that some of my patients had it, but I wasn't really doing a whole lot to help them. So when Alcon approached me um, to, to bring this device on board at our office, I thought, okay, well, now's my chance to really start helping these people. I'm just going to jump right in. I'm going to get the ILUX device and I'm going to start you know, treating these people and making them better. But that was me going from the ground up to the third or fourth step on the ladder without even considering the in-between steps. And it actually started to get kind of overwhelming as I started to talk to um, more of my colleagues, you know, who, who were into dry eye and they had all these other fancy pieces of equipment for diagnosis and for treatment. And they had all these, you know, other selling all these drops in their office. And I thought, whoa, wait a minute, this is now it's starting to feel like too much. I thought I was just going to bring in the ILUX, but really I got to do all these other things. And so this, um, you know, this is what I'm giving you guys here in this presentation is what I had to work through <clears throat> to figure out my own way uh, through this process. And the first step after talking to um, Alcon was, I'm going to mention Alcon a bunch of times, and it was really mainly just not to sell their product. It was just because they were the company initially that was really helpful for me to, with um, helping me get on, on the right track. And after speaking to my rep at Alcon and speaking to my friends and colleagues who were doing well in, in dry eye, the number one thing was not bringing in a device not, um, you know, not trying to figure out what the right eye drop was, but the number one thing was to actually develop a protocol. And initially this felt, then I thought, okay, well, a protocol, it, this never even really came across my mind um, to have a protocol. I thought, well, I'm a, I'm a doctor. I already know what the process is. I know when I see a disease, I know how to treat it, or I could figure it out on, on, the, on the fly, you know, based on the symptoms and the signs that I'm seeing in the slit lamp and so on. But from a bit, from not only a clinical perspective, but a business perspective, it was very, very important to develop an algorithm, if you will, of what it will look like to have a dry eye clinic, what it would look like for the patient. Um, you know, what will the patient pathway be from the time they walk in the door? What is the first experience they have, exposure they have to a dry eye conversation in our office? Is it going to happen when the doctor tells them they have dry eye? Or is it going to be something that happens at the front desk? that plants a seed and then the conversation goes from there. And what if it's a new patient versus an existing patient versus now, if you're at a point where somebody's walked in the door said, I know you guys do dry eye, I have dry eye, I'm here specifically for that. What is the journey gonna be for each of those people? And again, that can start to sound a little overwhelming, it did for me, but when you start to just put pen to paper, it's actually not that bad. It's really not, it, that's the easiest thing you can do is take a big piece of paper, scrap paper and start to just draw it out you know, here's patient A, this patient's an existing, existing patient, they've come in and seen me a few times now over the years. What's the, <clears throat> what is their exposure going to be to dry eye when they walk in the door and so on for the different people. And the next thing, maybe you would put this first on the list, but uh, the next thing is the fee structure. How are you going to get paid for this stuff? And what is each person going to pay you for each of their um, experiences at your office? And it's not that you're going to have 100 different fees, you're going to have a handful maybe at most, but you need to know which patient falls in which bucket and <clears throat> how much they're going to be paying. So everybody's on board. So you tell the staff it's an XYZ appointment. The staff knows what to build the, the, the patient right there. And then there's no conversations about, oh, I think they might be this, they might be that. I'm, I'll, you know what? I'm not sure. So I'm just going to bill you $50 because that's just my default number. We, we want to avoid that type of thing. And it's important to, you know, say, okay, well, patient, uh, you know, maybe you're at the end of a comprehensive eye exam and you say, you know what, you have dry eyes. Now you have your protocol already in, is set that, you know, this person is going to be coming back for their dry eye follow-up. So a lot of my colleagues will do a separate dry eye exam. So they'll just tell the patient at the end of the exam, you have dry eyes. I need you to come back uh, for a proper dry eye assessment. That's going to cost you a hundred dollars. Uh, just, you know, pulling numbers here. Uh, $100 for that, eye, that, that dry eye evaluation. And from there, we'll talk about what you're going to do next. Now, um, depends on your setting. So personally, I find that works well for some, uh, some settings and maybe not for others. So in our high street eye care location, we don't do that. We actually just encompass 
the important dry eye diagnosis things that we need to do into our comprehensive eye exam. And then we get, get the patient going from there. But it's important that you've already set that up beforehand. So you don't have to think about it each time you're going through the steps um, to really streamline the process. And then streamlining your treatment options. Do you have a mild dry eye patient, moderate or severe? And what is their treatment plan going to be? You should already have that set before you even start treating these patients. You should have that set. If it's mild, you're going to tell them to do warm compresses and use this XYZ eye drop. You already know that's going to happen and you send them on their way. And you already know then from there what their follow-up schedule is going to be. You just want to have this all set beforehand so you don't have to think about it on the, on the go. And you'll find as you do this, you'll realize the value in it, having it streamlined. And because we'll be able to find more people and re relieve them of their dry eye symptoms more efficiently. All right, so number one is protocol. Number two is, well, who are these dry eye patients? If you're gonna treat somebody, you have to first diagnose them. And, you know, again, my mind went to all the fancy equipment that I need to buy. I gotta buy a mybographer and a this and a that and digital slit lamp to take pictures and, you know, all these fancy things so I can diagnose my patient and, and come off as a, a big fancy doctor. I still don't now two years into my journey, I don't have any of this equipment. I've tested out a bunch of it. You know, every other month I, I, I reach out to a, a company or a company will reach out to me and say, hey, test out our equipment. So I'll, I'll bring it in for a few weeks and I'll see. But I've been treating a lot of patients and I still don't technically have one of these devices in my office. And the reason is we have, as clinical practitioners, we have most of what we need in our office already. And the number one thing we have is our slit lamp right? We can take a close up look at a patient's eye and we have our clinical ability and our, our skill to look at a patient's eye and see what's going on, maybe on a, um, on a gross level, maybe not on a super uh, <clears throat> quantitative level, but on a qualitative level, we can squeeze on an eyelid and see how much mybum is coming out of the gland. We can see if the eyelid looks um, inflamed and red and if, the, um, if there's... Um, scruff or buildup around the eyelashes, we can see those basic findings that will help us get an, a, a, an early diagnosis for that patient. And, you know, on the left-hand side picture here, uh, this little contraption, this is actually something that's supposed to fit on, um, on binoculars, but I, I bought it, it was, I don't know, $50 or something, not, not super expensive, but it just connects your phone. So you can take a photo and a pretty good photo. Oh, I wish I could show you the one I took yesterday. And actually I took one yesterday without this little contraption. I don't know if this is gonna show up here for you guys, but let me see if I can hold it up to the camera. Uh, so this, oh man, it's not showing up too well, that's too bad. Uh, I had a patient come in yesterday who had a, took a rock to the eye and had a conjunctival laceration. Um, and so I just pulled my phone up and held it right up to the camera and, um, and took a nice photo of it so I could keep track of the progress from this point forward. So, you know, you don't really need, a, you take patients, get the patient's permission, of course, to do that kind of stuff. But like, you don't need anything super fancy to get started. You have, um, we have our dye, we have fluorescein staining or uh, lysamine green, if you have that to stain the conjunctiva. We have the basic tools that we need to screen and diagnose our patients while they're right there in the chair. This is actually equally as important as setting a protocol, because if you're not diagnosing your patients, how are you going to know how to treat them? And before diagnosing, actually, screening is maybe the more important word. And I, and I said that in, in the, the first step, the very first part, the patient pathway, what is the patient's first exposure to the dry eye conversation going to be? And in our case, we implemented right away a screening questionnaire, dry eye questionnaire. And there's a variety of them. This is just a few of the, the questionnaires that are available. Um, we implemented the DEQ-5. It's five questions, as the number might suggest. Fairly easy to understand. Um, the, good, the good thing about screening is well, the multiple things. One is it, is it exposes, exposes the patient to the dry eye conversation right away when they walk in the door. So we gave this questionnaire to every single patient that came in the door, every single adult, whether they were new, um, uh, existing patients of ours, somebody who'd come in for 
um, dry eye comp concerns, we gave them this questionnaire. And sometimes qu patients would be like, well, I, I don't have dry eyes. Why do I need to fill this out? Well, just, just fill it out. Just tell us what you think about these. And, you know, lo and behold, they would actually be the way they filled it out. They clearly were dealing with symptoms related to dry eyes. So the, the good thing about this is it's, it quantifies the patient's symptoms. How much irritation are they getting on a daily or weekly basis? How much are their eyes watering or how much is their vision fluctuating? And you can show it to the patient like here, you scored uh, a 10 on the DEQ5 that puts you in a mild to moderate dry eye category. You know, that's, I'm not, that's not even a qualitative assessment. You wrote it down that this is what you're dealing with. So it, it helps us kind of discuss it with the patient again. So they get the exposure at the front desk. Um, the staff will kind of mention, oh, you know, we're, we're talking about more about dry eye. We're implementing new treatments for patients who are dealing with some of these issues, you know, dry eye, you could have grittiness or watery eyes. And then patients will say, oh yeah, I do get this sandy feeling in my eyes. And then they sit down in the exam room with the doctor. And of course, we'll repeat some of that same thing. And I'll show them the DEQ5 result. I'll show them um, some of these images that I have, static images, you know, nothing, no digital images that I've taken or, um, you know, high-tech mybography. I'll just show them these static generic images to say, here's what a normal eyelid should look like. Here's what yours look like. And that helps us start the discussion about the treatment. So screening and diagnosis is very, very important before we even get to trying to talk about treating any patients. And actually... <clears throat> Just very recently, we've changed our, um, our screening questionnaires. We used to use this uh, DEQ5, which is very much tailored towards diagnosing dry eye or, or teasing it out. But we've just kind of changed it up to something that's a bit more uh, customized for us. It's a little bit more tailored towards directing people, directing patients towards the appropriate treatment. It's less um, just quantitative. It's actually, you know, so the questions are a bit more like, do you deal with uh, fluctuating vision, yes or no? So then I can say, you said yes to dealing with fluctuating vision. Here's my suggestion for you now. Not, not um, leaving a little bit less of a gray area, which we're finding is working well for us. Okay, so step three is to retail these dry eye products that patients can use at home. So that's eye drops, ointments, lid wipes, warm compress, nutraceuticals, all these different things. Um, so we can really give patients the best products so we know that they can go home and, and, and start to treat their, their dry eye condition. Now, I don't know if everybody's able to retail these in their office, but I'll tell you what, uh, well, first of all, not every dry eye patient needs that super advanced treatment, right? We, we, when we developed our protocol, we just determined that some people are mild, moderate, some are severe. Those mild patients don't necessarily need to get the ILUX or the IPL or whatever it might be. So we, we recommend the correct, uh, uh, appropriate um, options for them to take home and use. Many ODs, many optometrists, and this is myself just two years ago, fell, fall into the trap of, you know, I got samples in the cupboard. Here's whatever sample I have in the cupboard. You can just go ahead and use that eye drop. You have dry eyes. Here's a refresh or a sustain or whatever I got sitting here. But there's a lot of problems with that. Number one is there's decreased compliance. The patient's going to take that drop home. They're going to forget about it. Or when, once the bottle's done, they're going to stop using it. <clears throat> or they're going to go to the eye drop aisle and they're going to see that there's 50 to hundred different eye drops in the aisle. And in here in North America, most of them say Visine. And so they'll say, well, that says Visine for dry eyes. I'll just take that one. It should be just as good as the one the doctor gave me. Excuse me, but we know it's not. We know that there's a lot of differences in, in the various eye drops, whether it's preservatives or other ingredients. Um, and so you end up getting patients who are using the wrong product. And, you know, I was then to, to try to overcome that, I was, um, I was even writing down on a piece of paper, um, you know, giving the patient a little piece of paper that said, oh, here, go look for this type of uh, warm compress mask, go look for this type of eye drop. And, you know, I don't know what they would do that piece of paper. Maybe again, they might make it to the, uh, the pharmacy. Maybe they wouldn't, but we know that the, their, um, Uh, we know that their compliance would definitely decrease. So my suggestion here is to start small. If you are able to retail these products in your office, start small. Start with just one or two key eye drops that you think are going to help the majority of your patients. Maybe start with one heat mask, uh, one lid wipe. You know, just that's exactly how we started. We had a max of maybe 
I think five products, two eye drops, one heat mask, one lid wipe and one omega-3. And now we sell six or seven different eye drops, you know, a couple of heat masks, a couple of wipes. Of, you know, we, we now we have a, a big grouping of products and that kind of expands over time as we say, okay, well, this person's got, you know, evaporative dry eye. Maybe they need something like this, this yellow eye drop over here called the eye drop NGD. Um, somebody's got more severe, somebody maybe needs more hyaluronic acid in their eye drop. Maybe we use this hilo, whatever it might be. We kind of tailor our selection to the type of dry eye patients we're seeing, but it all happens over time. And the last thing here that I think has been super helpful for us is we created a prescription pad. And the prescription pad looks like this. This is just something custom that I developed, uh, just kind of made up myself. And it's just a little you know, prescription pad size piece of paper. And it lists a few of the key components of at-home therapies, hot compress, lid wipes, things like that. And what I'll do is as I'm talking to the patient is I'll, I'll check it off or I'll circle or I'll handwrite the product and I'll tear it off. And that little tearing off motion, I really think that kind of like flips a switch for people. Like it just, it feels like it's an official prescription. You rip it off, you give it to the patient. And now I say, these are, the, these are the products I'd like you to use and the staff can help you with the rest at the front. They'll fill that prescription for you at the front. So they'll take that and I'll say, that's your homework. So make sure you hold on to that. You're gonna look at that list of things every single day for the next however many weeks. And then we're going to follow up with you at this time period based on our protocol. And that's significantly helped increase um, compliance. It's helped, you know, helped our bottom line because we're selling more products. But most importantly, it's actually significantly help patients feel a lot better. Now, um, I, I, I probably should try to measure it, but uh, there's a, a definite noticeable increase in the relief our patients are getting just from these simple at-home therapies because they're doing them the right way and doing them more often. Okay, so for the patients who need the in-office treatment, now these days there's, a, I feel like, like an unlimited number of treatment options out there, new machines coming out every other week. Um, and again, we follow our protocol. Maybe it's, um, the patient who tried the at home therapy, it didn't work for them. So we need to talk about in office treatment, or maybe it's a person who's a dry eye is just that severe. We need to jump right to the, the more significant in office treatment, or it's the patient who might even say to you, you know what, doc, I'm not going to do those hot compresses. Just zap me with whatever you got. Let's just do that instead. Trust me, those people exist. They're in fact, in fact, go a step further. They'll be like, do it right now. I'm probably not gonna come back. <laughs> I'm just too busy. Uh, you know, in my Abitur office, I have a lot of truck driver patients and they're like, you know what? I don't know my schedule. I'm gone for two weeks at a time on the road. Just do it now. Um, let's get this over with. And you know, we like those patients. We like to kind of get them like, all right, let's head over to the next room and, and get that treatment going. And these treatments are, you know, not inexpensive. Um, again, the one that got me started is this guy right here. This is the Ilux. And for us, the Ilux uh, roughly is about $500 per treatment. We, we recommend two to three treatments uh, over a period of a couple of months. Um, you know, we offer a package if a patient buys more than one treatment, but that, that's what we started with. Um, and this is the guy that got me into the, in really into the dry eye game. And so we, we started to offer this treatment. It's a nice quick treatment. It's painless. It's you're up and out of the chair. Um, you know, there's no gel or anything needed. It's very, very simple and easy, and it's very effective for, for our NGD patients. Um, but, you know, again, it's easy to get overwhelmed here with, these are just a few. This is a very, very small, um, you know, sample of the types of treatment options that are out there. The EI is, a, is an IPL, um, the BluffX to help to clean the eyelid margin. Um, tear care is a, a somewhat of an equivalent of the ILUX where it's, it's treating um, for MGD, Lipaflow is similar as well. The Ilex is cool because it's, um, you know, the tear care and the Lipaflow actually emit heat. The Ilex emits um, a light. It doesn't give off any heat. It's a very safe light. Like you, you can look at it. It doesn't damage your eyes, whereas the IPL is very, very high intensity. Um, you just simply apply, it's like a little caliper. You apply it to the inside of the eyelid and it's got uh, silicone coated tips so the patient doesn't feel any discomfort. You just gently close it. The light emits into the eyelid tissue. It heats the tissue from within and that express that heats the glands. And then it's got its own sort of caliper movement. You can just kind of hit the button and, and squeeze the eyelid to express the glands while you're right there. And all together, both eyelids, everything will be done in 15 minutes, super quick. So that's where we started. And after we start to get a good number of patients into the system here and we're treating, you know, 
handful of patients a week with the Ilex and we're like, okay, you know what, that's great for that subset of patients, but we have uh, people who have rosacea, we have people who have more inflammatory issues. Um, we started to look at what are other options. And so we actually, um, just a few months ago, invested in the um, in-mode system, which uh, this platform actually allows us to do two different types of, of modalities. It's radio frequency and IPL. Um, and again, there's other companies out there, but this was uh, ultimately our decision was we wanted to get into these two modalities because the more advanced uh, dry eye clinics that we knew of, my friends who were dealing with dry eye and more advanced cases were, were using these two technologies and getting amazing results. So we're just kind of getting the ball rolling on this. Um, and just to give you a quick taste of what they do. So radio frequency, that's the forma, this handle right here. Um, it emits a low wave, low energy um, electrical pulse between the two, um, the two, um, oh my gosh, the two ends of the electrodes here. It'll just sort of arc between them. And what that does is it doesn't go too deep, but it goes just below the skin, creates this um, uh, pulse just below the skin to create heat. And that handle that you see there, it's a square handle. It's probably, I don't know, an inch and a half square. And you, you just rub it. It's actually not this one here. This is just an example of what it looks like when you're doing it. But you'd go around the eyelid and it heats the tissue quite quickly. Just within a few minutes, you get the tissue um, all right. Within a few seconds, you get the tissue up to like the 42, 43 degrees that you need for therapeutic for um, treating MGD. And a few minutes of that treatment there, and you'll be amazed at how, like you pull the eyelid down and you'll get liquid just flowing out of those glands, or at least you'll get a lot of the gunk coming out very, very easily compared to if you were just to try to express it with, a, with, you know, uh, with any kind of expression tool without that kind of heat. So really good for MGD. Uh, the IPL, that's this guy here. So IPL is intense pulse light, um, has been shown over and over again to be very beneficial for inflammatory conditions. So that's rosacea or just inflammatory dry eye. And even for Demodex, um, when you do it, uh, you can see the patients wearing goggles here. So you can have them wearing goggles and you can try to pull as much of the eyelid out from under the goggles and try to treat right along there with the IPL, or you can get them to wear a corneal shield. So that's something that would actually slip under the eyelid. Then you can go right on top of the eyelid very safely because the corneal shield is protecting the, uh, the cornea um, and the, the eyeball itself. Um, so really beneficial for that. And so what we're doing for a lot of our patients is actually a combination of these two. So we'll get them to come in for a series of treatments. We'll do radio frequency one time, IPL the next and so on to try to combat both, um, both types of um, conditions. And this is something, again, we're fairly new into this. We're a couple of months into it, but we're starting to see some nice results with the um, RF and the IPL. So the last thing on the list here is teamwork. And I don't know, maybe this is the most important thing actually. Um, but when I say teamwork, I mean it on a few different levels. You know, teamwork to me initially, and maybe for you might mean teamwork within your office. So your staff, your doctors, you know, your technicians, everybody's on the same page, they're all working together. I love that image, everybody's got their hand in, right? Go team. Um, but uh, it helps to get everyone on the same page. So I was like, oh, well, I'm the doctor, I'm gonna be the one diagnosing and treating, so let me just make sure I got it all straight. But your staff has gotta be understanding what we're, what we're doing, what we're trying to treat, what kind of conversations to have with the patients. Why is it important to the staff to know this information? How can we get them involved so they feel like they're part of the process and they're helping making helping to make the patients feel better? Um, and you know, the staff really get into it. They really love it. Um, giving them the opportunity to grow within this, uh, excuse me, um, within this new new treatment, this new practice, new clinic that you're setting up um, is really nice. They, they, they enjoy the growth. And even getting them to do the treatments, if you're comfortable getting them to that point where just yesterday we had a trading where we got, um, one of our, our staff members, um, she was getting trained on doing the radio frequency in the IPL. So we're going to start, start to hand that off to her now. Um, but also incentivizing them so we can really get this thing rolling, right? So uh, as a really simple thing in the very beginning, we um, incentivize our staff just to get those dry eye questionnaires going because they would keep forgetting. Understandably, they had their own, um, their own protocol already and, and the dry eye questionnaire wasn't part of their their, their process yet. So we said, okay, look, we're going to give you two weeks. If we get every single patient uh, to have a dry eye questionnaire in that two weeks, we'll take every, to everyone out to dinner. You know, and that was easy, super easy for them. Nice little motivation for them. But as we go, it's like, okay, now 
Um, you know, if we are able to convert, the more patients we're able to convert to these treatments, the more incentives there are for patients, excuse me, our staff. <clears throat> but teamwork also means outside of the office. And that means with your dry eye reps, with the companies that supply these dry eye, um, you know, the eye drops and, and these new technologies to us, they really want to help. You know, initially, I think I had a bit of a combative uh, approach to my, to the, to these companies, the industries uh, out there in the industry. I always felt like, well, they're just trying to sell me. They're just trying to take my money. And they probably are trying to do that, right? But they do are, are actually offering valuable products, products that help. And their, their reps are very well trained. In fact, in many cases, they know more than I do about their certain products and certain things that, that we can implement in our office. So now I welcome them and welcome the conversations. And I sit down and I say, okay, so tell me what I can do better. Like, tell me what you're seeing somewhere else that we can implement here. Tell me what product you have that would help me solve this issue that I'm having with this patient. And they love when doctors lean on them. They love that um, you know, being able to be in that role and they, they do everything, they go out of their way to support. So uh, work with your reps actively. And then the last thing is leverage existing programs. A lot of uh, these companies have existing programs for optometrists to help you get off the ground, whether it's to support you financially, it's to support you get your protocols in place. Um, Alcon, again, I pulled this binder out now. Um, so Alcon has a program called Deep, the Dry Eye Excellence Program. And it's this giant binder with all these different things in here. Uh, you can see how big it is. Um, and it's got a lot of amazing things. It breaks down sales techniques. It breaks down management, dry eye management, all these other things, um, dealing with staff and all these other things in there to help us kind of get this going um, to make sure that we can succeed. And, you know, these companies, most of these uh, technologies have consumables, so per use costs. So the Ilux, for example, has a little tip on the end that's disposable, it's one-time use, one patient use. So once you're done, you've treated both eyes, it, it only lets you treat up to 10, 10 treatments and within a certain period of time, it's got the, the deliberate like planned obsolescence within it. Um, once you've done that, it doesn't work anymore. You gotta take the tip off and put a new one on and you gotta pay for that tip, of course, each time. So Alcon makes money every time I use this device. So they want me to use it. They're going to get me going with this device as best as they can to make sure I'm going through as many tips. So they're making more money, but then I'm making more money and the patients are getting treated. So it's a win, win, win. So they have, you know, uh, that in their interest as well. They want you to use their device. They don't want it to just sit on the shelf. They also want you to keep selling eye drops so they can keep making money. And this is where it becomes a bit of a partnership. So talk to your reps and, and you know, leverage their, their tools that they have at their disposal. And the last thing is a bonus tip is leverage social media. So um, I don't know which social media platforms are big in each of your uh, you know, respective countries, but here, Instagram, Facebook are kind of the biggest. LinkedIn is quite big. Um, you know, and so I would highly recommend, oh, of course, YouTube. I don't know how I forgot YouTube. YouTube is probably the biggest across the world uh, outside of Facebook. So I would highly recommend that you start to use these, you know, and initially it doesn't, it doesn't give you an instant return on your investment. And the investment really is your time. You don't have to spend any money on these things. Excuse me. Um, you know, I've been making my podcast for a while. Um, I was just telling the team earlier, I, I'm releasing my 50th episode this coming week. And that seems like a lot to me. 50 is quite a, probably more than I ever expected myself to make, but I, I stopped looking at, initially you start looking at the analytics of how many people are listening. You stop looking at that after a while because you're like, you know what, the reason I'm creating this is to put out the content, is to help people or to reach an audience. And when you start to create content, let's say for your dry eye practice, you put out consistently content to say, oh, I'd like to teach you about this dry eye condition. I'd like to show you that I have this technology in my office or I, that I offer this eye drop or that I have this expertise. You keep putting out that message constantly and eventually the audience comes to you. Eventually people start to you know, resonate with your message. So don't get discouraged if in the earlier stages, maybe there's not a lot of people connecting with you, but these platforms are super helpful if you continue to put out these messages regularly and you'll start to, start to draw new patients into your office. Okay, so that's everything. Thank you so much for giving me the time and uh, I'll stop sharing and I'll let the uh, TWP team take over here.
Oh, you're muted. Lorcan, I can't hear you. Sorry, Dr. Harbour. Can you hear me now? Yeah, very insightful presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, and that can be reflected in the amount of questions we have. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to pass over to my colleague, Rola, who's going to ask you some questions we've had from our uh, attendees when they registered for the event. For people who get the registrations, and we also have some questions uh, from the audience from today too as well. So I'll pass you over to Rola. Thank you, Dr. Harper, uh, for a very exciting and engaging presentation. Uh, you have covered a very good topic and have given us some wonderful insight that we can take away today. We have some questions which have been submitted by our attendees. And with your permission, I would like to put these questions to you now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So uh, question number one from Jasira. She's asking, is there any relation between dry eye and pregnancy? Um, yes, uh, but I don't know if I can give you, so the short answer is yes, uh, but I don't think I can give you maybe a very specific um, reasons, but you know, for sure, I see many, many um, pregnant women who come in um, who are dealing with dry eye and they never did before. <clears throat> the few sort of, um, I guess you could say educated guesses I can give you is one is just um, um, hormonal changes. And we know that hormones play a big, big role in dry eye. Um, so hormonal changes that can result in, in imbalances on the ocular surface. The other thing, you know, this is just an observation on my part, but like observing my wife, for example, or, or other, other patients of mine, um, you know, I find um, that there's maybe a relationship with, um, oh, this may be more for new mothers with, you know, newborns. But, you know, that time when you're taking time off right after the baby's born, I find that a lot of women are actually on their phone a lot um, at that time when they, you know, they're maybe they're, they're nursing or they're doing something else or caring for the child. And that also will result in the dry eye. But I think during pregnancy, it's probably got a lot to do with uh, hormonal changes more than anything else. And so we, we just try to, at that time, um, because we know it's most likely going to be somewhat temporary. Um, we try to alleviate the symptoms. And if there's any obvious changes on the ocular surface, try to treat those. Okay, great. So the other question from Arifa. Uh, he's asking in the office forma treatment, what result in excessive watering? Does it irritate the patient in any way? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? So the forma treatment? Okay, okay. Yes, uh, his question about forma treatment, yep. what results in excessive watering? Does it irritate the patient in any way? Uh, no irritation to the patient. Yep. It's actually very, very soothing. Um, patients almost fall asleep. The only reason they don't fall asleep is because the machine is beeping <laughs> next to them. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it feels like a spa treatment. So, you know, the um, our radio frequency and IPL actually come from aesthetics, dermatology, there, there were skin treatments for facial and other parts of the body. Um, and, and radio frequency, basically it feels like somebody's taking a, a, a soft or like a, a smooth, um, I don't know, like a ball almost, a warm ball and rubbing it around your face. It's very gentle, feels really nice. You've also got, for those treatments, you've got the ultrasound gel, it kind of makes it frictionless. Um, so the treatment itself, that does not feel, there's no pain, discomfort at all. Um, the time that patient during the treatment might feel, they won't feel discomfort during it, or maybe they'll, it'll cause them a tiny bit of discomfort after is when we go to express. So when we do radio frequency or IPL, we actually take a little expression tool under the microscope, we'll go in there and we'll gently express each of the, you know, the glands along the eyelid. Sometimes that can leave the patient with a little bit of redness and irritation for a few minutes afterwards, but that's all. Okay, thank you. There's another uh, nice question actually. He's asking about what is the permanent cure for dry eye? Uh, so that's the, uh, that's the conversation we might have to have with every patient. And that is that this is a chronic and a progressive condition. So there, mean, when we say chronic, that means it's not going away. There's no permanent cure. As far as we know, you know, maybe there's something out there and we haven't uh, discovered it or implemented it correctly yet. But all of the uh, treatments that we have are to treat um, and to reduce, you know, symptoms um, 
and the presence of the condition and hopefully get the patient feeling better for as long of a period as we can. But we know that often it will come back. Um, and so what we try to do is with these, with these more advanced treatments is get the patient as close to baseline as we can, where they're feeling as comfortable as possible, and then tell them to do the maintenance things at home, like the hot compresses and things like that, that will help to maintain the results for as long as possible. Some people feel like they've been cured. They don't deal with their dry eye symptoms hardly at all for a very, very long time. Others we might have to see back every six months to a year. Sorry, you're going to start to hear uh, babies in the background. They're just, they're just waking up. Uh, so I apologize for the screaming in advance. Okay, the next question from Maria. She's asking, what kind of contact lenses do we prescribe in various degrees, a dry eye, in relation to material design and water content? Yeah, that's great. Um, so I actually really have just like a one lens that I go to um, for, for dry eye patients. First of all, if they're significant, if they have severe dry eye, I take them out of contacts. Um, but uh, if they have you know, moderate or manageable dry eye, um, it's the Daily's Total One. So I'm not sure if it's the same brand in other countries, um, but the Daily's Total One is probably the most comfortable lens that, um, that, that's out there. And as far as patient feedback, the most comfortable that they've, given, they've uh, told me. Um, and the Daily's Total One has a technology that's different than almost all other contact lenses. And that is that it has, sorry, give me a second. Um, the uh, has okay, water, water, water gradient technology. And so that is that um, it's got its sort of silicone hydrogel, excuse me, silicone core, and then coming out from the core, it's water. So at the surface, it's almost 100% water. And so in that interaction with the ocular surface and with the aqueous, or excuse me, with the tear film, it, it blends in very, very well. Um, as opposed to most other lenses that have some kind of a combination of silicone and water and sort of just all blended in, um, so more homogenous, we'd call it, and the coatings on top and that type of thing to help. So there are other lenses that do very, very well, but the total one being that water gradient technology, I find that does just a lot better than any others. Now, if we're going to, I don't personally do specialty contacts, but I would, I would highly recommend if you're really into it and you're really into contacts, look into scleral lenses. I have a few friends across North America who do sclerals and, um, and in the UK as well. And, uh, and sclerals seem to be amazing for patients who have dry, significant dry eye. So sclerals, if you're not familiar, they're, they're rigid lenses, they're larger, they fit on, on the sclera, on the white part of the eye, right? So they're quite large, but that also makes them more comfortable than gas permeable. So because gas permeable lenses sit right on the cornea and they're, you feel them every time you're blinking, whereas the, the sclerals essentially fit under the eyelid. So you don't feel them on blink and it vaults over the cornea. So it creates a barrier between the eyelid and the cornea. So you're not getting that friction. And I've mm -hmm. seen people with severe dry eye when they put, get put into a scleral, it, their dry eye gets a lot better because of that protection. So that's something worth looking into as well. Okay, so the other question from Salal, he's asking which form of treatment is more effective, drops or gel? Drops or gel? Um, it would depend on the patient. That's very much related yeah. to the, the severity of the dry eye. And, and there's a lot of different types of drops, different concentrations of hyaluronic acid and things. That would be, depending on the patient I'm seeing, um, I'd recommend accordingly. Okay. So we'll go to question number three here. So are there any latest treatment management option for patients having severe dry eye syndrome? Yeah, um, a couple of the ones that I mentioned in the presentation, uh, radio frequency and IPL are, are two of the more recent. They're not brand new, um, but those are two of the more recent. Um, treatment options. There's something coming out that's called neurostimulation. This is going to be, I think, more for patients who have like Sjogren's or, you know, aqueous deficient dry eye, but um, essentially it's stimulating the lacrimal gland to release more moisture. Um, that's going to be, I think, coming out on the market more in the near future. And then I think there's some more advanced eye drops. In fact, there's a friend of mine here in Vancouver who does PRP, which is pla um, platelet rich plasma, which is essentially drawing your own blood and spinning it in a centrifuge and drawing out the plasma and turning that into an eye, essentially just taking the plasma, putting it in a dropper bottle 
and you put that on the surface of your eyes for, for severe dry eye, um, she's shown to, to see a lot of improvement. Um, so I would, if you're on Instagram, I would check her out or go to her website. Uh, oh, Vancouver Eye Doctor. That's Vancouver, E-Y-E-D-R dot C-A. Her name is Mania Madan, or you can find her on Instagram at Mania Madan. She's, she's the only person I know who does it, um, period, like anywhere. I don't know anybody else who does it, but that's some pretty cool cutting edge stuff that's, that seems to be doing really well too. Okay. So our and if you do question, connect with her, uh, if you do connect with Mania, tell her Harbir sent you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this question uh, asking: Sometimes dry eyes does not recover by prescribing lubricants. What are other ways to cure it? Um, yeah, you're right about that for sure. So sometimes drops are not enough. Um, so first of all, looking at making sure you have the right eye drop. Okay. Um, a lot of the over the counter drops are, are not, they're just never going to work. They're just not good enough. Um, the eye drops, certain brands, you know, that we sell in our office have very high concentrations of hyaluronic acid or maybe are gel based, or maybe have a combination of other um, um, ingredients that can help stabilize the, the tear film. So that's one step is like, if you're using generic drops and they're not working, maybe look at more spe specialized drops. But if those are not working, I mentioned a couple of other treatments in, in, the, in the conversation, right? So most people, we know, you know, uh, Lorcan was mentioning earlier, the TFOS dues too, you know, based on that, we know 86% of people have some amount of, 86% of dry patients have some amount of MGD components. So that's really what we focus on treating is the meibomian glands. So work on getting those functioning. And that could be with, with as simple as doing warm compresses with a heat mask on a daily basis. <clears throat> We've even done a simple thing where we get patients to come in and put the heat mask on for 10 minutes and then I'll go ahead and express their glands in the office. That's very basic, it's not super advanced, but then we can go to the advanced treatments like the ILOX radio frequency and things like that. So uh, it's, it's all about step pro, pro, um, setting up that protocol and knowing which patient needs which treatment. Um, but yeah, I found that a good percentage of paper, oh my gosh, good percentage of patients don't um, get the relief with just your generic eye drops. Okay. Uh, there's another nice question from uh, Barsita, I think. What medication we can give in dry eye related to glaucoma? Which medication can we give for dry eye related to glaucoma? Yes. That's the question. I'm not sure if I fully understand, um, like, are we th we're thinking of a an, an, an medication that's good for dry eye and glaucoma both? Because um, I don't know if there is anything specifically in that category. Um, I, I, excuse me. I think she yeah. means sometimes a glaucoma drop tends to dry out the eyes. So what to work with after the glaucoma drop? Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Oh, thank you for clarification. Okay. So I think, first of all, I th oh man, I, I, I wasn't prepared for, because um, I, I forgot it now, but I believe that there is a new or fairly new or coming out soon um, version of like a Zalatan or something like that, that they're do doing in a gel-based preservative free. So it itself will be somehow soothing to the eye, but um, really any, any good quality lubricating drop is fine. Um, you know, just as long as they're not using, you know, using the drops simultaneously at the same time, I, I, I'll often put them on. One of my favorite drops is Thielos Duo. Um, I'm not sure if it's called Thielos Duo in other countries or just Thielos or, or whatever, but it has, um, it's preservative free. It's got good concentration of hyaluronic acid, but it also has a third ingredient called Trehalose, which helps to um, support any, in fact, even heal the ocular surface, the corneal surface. And I find that that works really well because some of these other eye drops can almost be damaging to the ocular surface. So that's a good one. Uh, if you have access to that, I would recommend that one. Thank you for answering it. Uh, so question five, do eye lubricants have any specific side effects? And also kindly tell about recommended dosage for a different level of dry eyes. Yeah, sure. Yeah, the, some of them definitely do have side effects. So um, you know, generally the more you get into dry eye, the more you'll, you'll hear 
conversations about non-preserved or preservative free drops. And, and most people jump right to those now because the ocular surface, if you're any more than mild, let's say you're moderate to se severe dry eye, the ocular surface is already somewhat compromised. When you start adding preservatives, those can irritate the eyes. Um, you know, other over-the-counter generic eye drops like Visine is a big brand out here. I don't know other brands in other countries. Um, <clears throat> the preservatives they use or other ingredients they use to get the red out, you know, those can be somewhat harmful to an already compromised ocular surface. So they can cause more redness, they can cause delayed healing. Um, so, so we try to avoid those. And so the best way to know you're getting a better quality eye drop, step one is just preservative free. Um, so knowing that it's preservative free is key. Looking for something that's got a higher concentration of hyaluronic acid, um, you know, which has been shown to be kind of the ideal lubricant right now, component of lubricating drops right now. And um, as far as, you know, the different severities, you know, so there's different types of dry eye as we've discussed. Um, we might start with something. So the Hyabac, for example, is a product that's got good concentration of hyaluronic acid. It's, it's preservative free. It's also got some electrolytes in there to help kind of balance the pH on the surface of the eyes. We know um, pH gets thrown off and that can cause a lot of the symptoms patients feel. The theolose has the trehalose that helps corneal cells to heal and absorb more moisture. Um, if we're, there's even drops that are more specific to meibomian gland dysfunction now that also have little bits of oily components in the drops to help supplement the oil, surf, oil layer of the, um, you know, of the tear film. And then we get into the gel drops are more kind of more severe dry eye. They got higher concentra concentrations of HA. They got they're more viscous. They stay on the surface of the eyes longer. Um, so that's kind of going along the progression of more towards more severe dry eyes um, is usually how we go. And most of the time I'm recommending QID or four times a day um, for most of these patients. Like even for a mild, I'm jumping right to four times a day because for two reasons. One, I want the patient to know what it feels like when they have lots of lubrication. And two, if I tell them four times a day, they might do it twice a day. You know, we know compliance is not always the greatest. Um, so at least for a mild patient, they're getting a couple of drops in. For severe, I might be telling them six or eight times a day. And because it's preservative free, I'm comfortable getting, letting them use the drops that many times. Some patients are using it hourly, just so you know, like people who have like severe dry eye and the cornea is compromised hourly, or I'm getting them to use a combination of gel and ointment and all this other stuff. So it's we'll, based on uh, each case by case. Thank you, Dr. Harper. Thank you very much for answering those questions. Unfortunately, in the interest of time, we may not have answered all the questions. So if you do have any further questions you would like to be answered, you can email them directly with the email address, which is on the screen right now. And uh, so we will get back to you, Larkin. Can I, sorry, add one, uh, one last quick thing? If uh, you can email me at that email address, I'm, I'm always happy to, um, connect that way. You can also find me uh, again on social media is easy for a lot of people. So Instagram is Harbir Cyan dot OD uh, also on LinkedIn and um, Facebook and all the other ones, but Instagram is the one that I'm kind of on the most. So feel free to, to reach out to me there. Sorry, but in the interest of time, we may not be able to answer all your questions. So do thank you very much for all your questions. If you'd like to email Dr. Harbour Savan, you just had the email address a few moments ago. Uh, so thank you very much for your attendance today. Uh, it is well appreciated. Your thoughts are very important to us too as well. And we will be sending you an email directly after this presentation, which we'd like you to give us some feedback. Uh, the next World of Optometry webinar is going to be on the 19th of June. Uh, the topic is not yet announced at the present moment. Um, we did have some sad news of the World of Optometry recently where one of our uh, colleagues unfortunately passed away. And we'd like to have one minute of silence just to recognize um, Dr. Jehan Balagi. And what I'd like to be able to do is pass you over to my colleague, Kenrick, who's going to play a short video. Hi, Mabuhay. I'm Dr. Jehan Dalyaga Perez. I'm a graduate of Doctor of Optometry, which is a six-year course here in the Philippines. And here in the world of optometry, I'm one of the managing directors, particularly of the creative and design team and the social media team. Ang maganda dito sa grupo namin, dito sa The World of Optometry, para lang kaming isang malaking pamilya. Lahat ng mga kasama ko dito, para ko lang kapatid, katropa, ganyan. 
And since magkakaiba kami ng time zone, at least isa sa amin gising, di ba? At any time, at any moment. So, pwede kang magtanong, any time din, any moment, di ba? <laughs> pwede kang magtanong, pwede kang humingi ng tulong, and everyone is very warm and welcoming as soon as you join the group. Ang maganda pa dito sa grupo namin, since international siya, uh, marami kang mga kasalumuhang iba't ibang optometrists from different parts of the world. So, malalaman mo rin yung ibang practice ng mga ibang optometrist sa ibang bansa, di ba? So, marami kang matututunan. And, ang maganda pa dito sa grupo na to, you would feel like you're part of one big community. Kasi dito sa Pilipinas, konti lang yung mga optometrists eh. Kasi konti lang din yung schools na nag-offer ng course na to. So, feeling namin ang konti-konti namin. So, in this group, feeling mo nga naman ngayon na parang ang dami-dami nyo. <laughs> Which is a refreshing change for me. And I feel very honored to be an optometrist kasi alam ko with this profession ang dami-dami kong matutulungan na tao. Ang mga mata natin is one of the major sense organs of the body. So talagang gamit na gamit siya mula paggising mo hanggang pagtulog mo. Diba? So araw-araw nagagamit mo siya. And alam ko as an optometrist kapag may napalinaw ako na mata mayroon din akong na-improve na quality of life ng isang tao. Thank you, Kenrick. And thank you, Dr. Harbour, and thank you for all the attendees. I'd now like to bring this presentation to a close. I bid you a good day, goodbye, and good night. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you.